its well. It is situated in a field near the railway. This well flows into a stream. There is no church near. we used to walk down across the fields because our land comes right up to Mannion's land and then we come into the graveyard and we walk down to where the sweat house and the well is um, and we used to just be playing around um, we used to get stuck a lot in our wellies in the mud we, then we couldn't get off and then we pretend one of us is sick and put us into the into the chalk alish um, but it was kind of a place I went to a lot as a kid because well like there's not many places you can walk to on your own um so i used to come over and just hang around i used to hang around the um the carmelite church as well because there's little places that you can hide as a kid as well and get into um but it was always a peaceful kind of energy to this place so it's nice when you get in a fight with the parents as a kid you can just run away to river bond to the sweat house well we know in the celtic context that the celts were they used well as places for worship um, meeting the gods and uh, there were certain wells throughout Ireland that had that reputation when Christianity first came to Ireland St. Patrick's time so in, in uh, Armagh for example you had a, a well in Shun you had a well to uh, or John at the Charlotte's well and that was a place where the people would congregate and there were certain pagan practices which they'd probably practiced at that, at that place but when uh, Christianity came then uh, the early Christians that says in St. Patrick's time they Christianized these practices and so they made Christian places of worship out of the wells and in June we have the example of Temple of Tubber Jarnath, the well of Jarnath. In Shum you had at least a half a dozen wells in this part of the town, maybe more elsewhere. And uh, these were places where the people came, congregated, got the, what, the day's supply of water, and talked to one another. So wells became a place where um, Conversation was exchanged. The news of the day was was got at the wells. In later times, it might have been the barbers, or the butchers, or something like that. But in the early times, it was the well. And in, in, you, you find in, in, the places like Temp, uh, Tupper John, that you had an annual get together there. And uh, originally it was pagan, and then it became Christian. And they had there were various prayers said that. And when the uh, penal laws were at their worst, and uh, mass was not allowed, the people came together at the wells, so that wells were a place for, for Catholics to congregate in the in the penal times. Hmm. How would I define a holy well? Well, I suppose it's a place where that has been visited by a saint, sanctified by a saint, and frequented then by people who worship that saint, so that it became associated with the saint. My mother and my father probably to lead the pony. We went to the pony and tracked to a well in called Oran. It was St. Patrick's well. And we were, there were, I suppose she had an older brother or sister minding the babies at home because there were nine of us. And we got into the trap. And of course, so exciting going off in those days. I'm talking now over 60 years ago. And my mother, you know, and the other people around, they went around the well and they said their prayers and there were probably Hail Marys in our fathers, but they threw stones in. And so we were so excited because we got our stones, but it wasn't the prayers we were saying, it was the splash that was made. But an amazing thing is that years on, 
Now I see a different symbol to the splash. And I see a different symbol to the storm. And that everything has life. And the water that we're talking about. And the memories of those days. It's very difficult. If you ask to me, will you explain who God is? I find it very difficult. So, defining or describing a holy well is, is I would, I'd like to put the focus for all holiness on the, w, on the word W, whole, instead of the word H. And it doesn't matter who goes there, and it doesn't matter what denomination they have. If they're, it's even said the non-believers, but I've met so many people who tell me the non-believers, and sure, my God Almighty, I nearly need down and adore them, there's such believers and they don't realize it. It's when I go, or any of us go to a place that we feel is going to be of some benefit to us. Benefit might be the word, that makes it holy. The well in Happy Trinity uh, dates from the 13th century, and it was, again, part of a monastic settlement. The monastic settlement which was established by uh, uh, Richard de Burgo. Again, the, the name de Burgo uh, translates to the modern term Bork, uh, which is a common name in the west of Ireland. But um, a part of a, a, monast a monastery, and the monastic, monastic settlement was for the pre-mount's detentions, which sounds a very big name, but uh, they would have been uh, more commonly known as Norbertines, but they were best known perhaps as White Friars. Holy Wells were essentially uh, simply because they were part of um, the, a, a monastic settlement. But a lot of the wells that are dotted around the place, uh, say for instance, the one that springs to mind is uh, St. Bernard's Well in Abinock Moy, and that's out in the middle of nowhere, uh, you might say, uh, and it, 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 there's no monastic settlement near it. And the, the concept of a holy well was simply a, a, a Christianizing of the pagan rituals at that particular time, simply because water was always regarded as the source of real life. And that was the important thing about it. Uh, you know, it gave life, and if you haven't water, well, you would die. You know, it's as simple as that. Yeah, so my uncle remembers people coming from, not just the local area, but from Tume, um, from further up in Kilrear, and coming down three Sundays before Reek Sunday, so in early July, um, and walking out to the well and going around the well and leaving offerings into the stones in the well, but also putting them into the water um, as a kind of a ritual. Um, now, some people say that the well is part of an adoration for St. Bridget, but other people say it's linked to um, St. Teresa from a villa um, in Spain, whereas the, which is related to Carmelite nuns. So it's hard to know um, from my point of view, I'm sure there's historians and local heritage people that are probably know better. But for us, they were they were linked, but they were kind of different. Um, and of course, the uncles also remember maybe some of the, the money not staying in the well um, and being used for other intentions. In the Chakalish, when someone was sick with the fever, they'd light a fire and heat it all up. And it's in quite a boggy area, quite a lot of water. So I'd say it must have caused steam to come up. And once there was steam, um, the fire was taken out and then the person who was sick was put in. Um, and it, then when they'd sweated enough and maybe got the sickness out, they were either water was brought from the well and poured over them or they were put into the well. That's what the, the locals would say around here, that they're interlinked, that one ritual was done first and then the other ritual. Yeah, so the abbey and the well is probably equidistant from Kilareran and Chum. Uh, you can see Kilrearan Church just out here. You can also see the Holy Well um, in Abbey from here. So it's directly lined up there. You can see Knock Row. And then if you actually go further this way, if the trees weren't there from our house, you can see Knock Ma. And then also from our house, you can see Kilpatrick. So there seems to be lines. There's something like it's in a good position. It's not here for no reason. My first experience in our introduction to the Wells, believe it or not, was when I moved to Churchview in the late 1960s. 
And right down at the back of my garden, I discovered a well. St. Paul's well. Most uh, famous of them all, I suppose, is the Abbot Trinity well. Still in operation. And it's great that it's available and people have access to it. So that leads us to be and have looking up the map and see where are the other wells uh, located. You had the Black's Well down the ra- the railway line down here, leading on the Valleghetta Road. You had the Priest's Well, and and uh, you had several wells dotted all over. Do you have a memory of, from your childhood of going to wells or any? Oh, I have fond memories of going to the bar in Clunasca. And mid cycle down through Plumalaskra down into Clunto, down to Hogan's Road. And there's the beautiful well there located in the commonage. And you can I often pass that way going on to the N17. And I it brings back fond memories going down with the sweet can to fill it up with pure water for the glass that were cut in the turf. And I firmly believe it was people's faith that led the wells holy. And very often people, after visiting the well, if they had particular ailments and they had bandages, they'd leave them hanging on the trees or the furs around the well. Reminders that their ailment was cured. And the story goes back to Bishop Plunkett. Some of his livestock started eating the bandages and he got kind of benign and he stopped the track to the well. So the one that I heard was that Bennon was uh, attached himself to Patrick. He was originally from, I think, well, the, according to legend, up from another part of the country. And Patrick, uh, as, as, as was his wont, decided he was going to do his 40 days of penance on what we now call, call Crow Patrick. So he climbed the... Uh, he climbed the uh, the mountain and Ben and with them and when he got to the top of the mountain he said oh forgot the bell <laughs> so he said to Ben and will you go back down he said and get that bell for me and Ben and decided to do so but on the way up he was tempted with the, complete with bell on his way back up the mountain he was tempted by the evil one who suggested that this bell might be the source of all Patrick's power you see and that he should hang on to it, keep it for himself, say nothing, you know. <laughs> so he gets into Patrick's presence and he has sequestered the bell someplace on his on his uh, on his form. And uh, Patrick says, Did you get the bell? And he said, I didn't, and at that the bell fell clanging to the floor. So Patrick imposed a penance on him. He said, Because you because you have sinned, you women you may not sleep for two nights in the same bed. Eat, eat for two days on the same ta- at the same table. Or drink on two subsequent days from the same well. He was, he was committing to a life of travel. Uh, until the stone that I'm now putting into your p- pocket or in some, in some receptacle in the garments that they wore at that time falls out. And apparently and traditionally, though the, the local folklore has it, that it was at Kilbannon Well that the stone fell out and this well sprung up. There's another small well, well, there's another very big well, which was the source of uh, all our county council water supply until recently we started getting it, I think, from, from Loch Corrib. It's called Tubbernilower. And for a long time, people thought, well, there was a scholar drowned there and the books were floating, and that's why it's called Tubbernilower people decided that they may write the lives of the saints. In that, there is recounted, and Peter Harbison has repeated it recently in some of the t- details he wrote down about Gilbanan, a tradition that Benin met and cured 12 lepers at the at Tubber de Lauer, as they called it. The older people used to translate as the, as the, as the well of the books, but in actual fact, I think uh, Lauer as a leper and yower is a book in Irish, they're phonetically almost indistinguishable, you know. So they, those were, now that, that well, surprisingly enough, never suffered from any drying out. I mean, it was the, it was the main source of water for, I'd say, about two or three parishes for, for, for 600 houses in the last 20 years, you know, in the last, yeah. 
the theory about the Holy Wilds initially was that there would have been sacred Celtic sites, because the Celts, uh, the Celts, uh, I mean Julius Caesar before he went in to conquer them in France in the Belle Gallico said these people are funny. They have no temples. They worship in oak groves and they worship at Wales and they worship in other places. So there was a there was a strong feeling. Uh, in in the older Celtic religions, that these were sacred places, and the Christians are the the Christians were very good at subsuming a lot of those places into their kind of, and it made sense. Like the the Celts never murdered anyone because they wanted to be a different religion or anything. They were a very accepting group of people, and uh, presumably the Celts in their own way decided. Yeah, or, or the, the the Christians in their own way decided, well, look, this is a sacred place for them. We'll make it a sacred place as well, you know. So that it could go back literally to the, uh, you know, pre-Christian. Yeah, and I suppose you know there is, there is instances of uh, offerings being made to water to water deities. Yes, sort of yes, yes, that, yes, so yes, yes. There are instances. There are instances as well where the Celts set up different people to ensure. Uh, now it would be on their power to ensure, but they'd have a king of the harvest and a king of this and that and the other. And if any, if any of these people fail to deliver harvest-wise or prosperity-wise, at the end of the year they had their throat cut and they were thrown into a well. <laughs> you know. Now it might be, it might not be an adequate solution for modern politicians, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.